welcome wherever you are around the world to the three triple z world cup show my name is gabriel d'angelo it is wonderful to have your company and speaking of wonderful company allow me to introduce to you two three triple z broadcasters who are well they live breathe and some say even go to bed with a football tucked under their arm Absolutely. at night <laughs> so just sitting next to me from the irish broadcasting group we have a lady who's played pretty much every sport there is, you name it, she's played it. And she's also quite an accomplished jazz singer as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, please start clicking your fingers and <laughs> welcome Dion Leonard. Hi. <laughs> How are you, Dion? I'm good, Gabe, and yourself? I'm good, thank you. And am I right in saying that this isn't your first foray into the visual medium, that you used to do a TV show with... Jamie Redfern from Young Talent Time. Oh my gosh, now you're taking me back, Gabe. I did. <laughs> it was called Cabaret on the Road. I think we did about three episodes for Channel 31. And uh, I was in a group at the time called Two's Company. And obviously, I was very tall, so I was the crowd in the middle of the group. Yeah. Um, I'd forgotten I'd actually done that. So <laughs> where on earth did you drag that up for? Well, we have some footage. Can we? Uh, no, <laughs> it's, it's all good. But um, I, for one, I'm looking forward to your uh, rendition of All My Loving at the end of every episode. Fantastic. So be, I'm up for good. it. So if, if that's not an incentive <laughs> to watch this show, I, I don't know what is. I mean, what more do you want? If there's never a better time to have Gabriel at your feet, it's that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. And sitting at the end of the couch, sitting next to Dion, we have a man from the German Broadcasting Group. He's a, a man who's a medical scientist who's busy working on cures for Alzheimer's and migraines and is also working on his speech for when his beloved Germany win yet another World Cup from the German Broadcasting Group, Bernd Merkel. Hello, Bernd. How are you? Gabriel, hello. I'm very well, thank you. And I'm really excited and very grateful to be with here with you and with Dion. That's good. And that's Dion, that's Bernd, and uh, looking forward to hearing from them both from time to time during the uh, upcoming weeks. And I also like to talk a little bit about 3ZZZ. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 3ZZZ is Australia's largest ethnic community radio station. Uh, we've been broadcasting since 1989. Uh, we operate in the suburb of Brunswick in the city of Melbourne. And uh, we broadcast programs in over 50 different languages. And this year we've been uh, really lucky, really fortunate to work in a partnership with Football Victoria, who are the governing body of the sport here in Victoria, where we've been broadcasting live matches of the National Premier League of Victoria for both men's and women's competitions. And we've been doing that in conjunction with the FIFA-approved Oceania Club of the Century, the mighty South Melbourne Football Club. So we've been working with both organisations and it's been really, really wonderful. Uh, we've also been doing podcasts where we've been talking to people from non-for-profit grassroots community footballing organisations. Some of those people uh, will we'll meet during the course of the few weeks. And it's been an amazing journey so far. And uh, we thought, well, the World Cup is coming around the corner. We're the world radio station and we love the world game. So um, what can we do to uh, celebrate the World Cup and just take our project a little bit further? So um, we decided to uh, do this show. So uh, we approached the uh, station manager of 3ZZZ, John King. I approached him in his office and f did what he normally does. He said, who are you? And get the hell out of my office. <laughs> but f five minutes later, he was like, yep, sounds good. Let's do this show. And uh, we contacted the wonderful people here at Studio M4. And uh, here we are working together to do this program. So uh, wherever you're watching this show, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be on M4 Live, we hope that you enjoy it. And uh, we hope that you uh, like it because uh, we're big football fans. And uh, yeah, so um, I think... I think we've got all the housekeeping out of the way. I think we've, we've introduced... Turn your uh, mobiles off. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. We've introduced Dion, we've introduced Bern, we've introduced myself, who cares. Uh, talked about 3 triple Z, so I guess it's time to talk about the biggest, the best, the most important sporting event in the world. That's right, the AFL draft. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. no. <laughs> Was, no, no, no. I mean, because like in commercial media here in Melbourne, that's all they talk about. It's like it's like nothing else exists. But no, of course, I'm talking about the World Cup. And I did say just a little bit in when, in the intro for you, Bernd, about Germany's chances. I think they've got a very good chance of winning it. But what do you think? Well, there is the fan and supporter, and there is the <laughs> um, yeah kind of expert. So. 
I mean, when you talk about the World Cup, Germany always is there when you name the teams that can win the World Cup, that, that for sure. I mean, we won it four times in the past, we won in 2014, but we had a very terrible performance in 2018, first time in history that we lost in, in group stage and were kicked out, literally kicked out, and we deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, now it's an interesting time because um, some people say we have the European Cup 2024 coming up in Germany and maybe that World Cup is a step towards that. But I think it is a World Cup and we need to perform here and now. So coming back to your question, um, I would say we have a chance, but we are definitely not, I would say, in the top five, six teams. So the change between uh, from, from Löw to Flick as a coach, as a manager, uh, was definitely necessary. The last two matches before the World Cup in the UEFA Nations League, we lost against Hungary at home. Uh, in England, we were 2-0 up and then conceded three goals in 15 minutes. So from that end, I would say I'm very cautious. I would be happy if we make it to the quarterfinal already to be honest. Yeah. I think you're underplaying your chances actually, Jeremy. Yeah. I mean, the fact is that Flick was um, the assistant to Lowe in the fourth world title that Germany won. So he knows his way around the, the games. Yes, he spent the last two years at Bayern Munich as coach, but he's got two Bundesliga titles under his belt with that. The DFB Cup, the UEFA Super Cup. He's also got a FIFA, the World um, World Club Cup. And there's the, the UEFA Champions League trophies. He comes with the creds to get the team through this little transition, if you want to call it, with yeah. um, the players, the strikers and everybody to come together. And he's made some really good decisions. He's pulled um, Thomas Muller back into the squad as well. Mm -hmm. And he seems to have a really good formation. He's been playing in the 4-3-2-1 formation, apart from the 1-1 draw to England in June, which was 3-4-2-1. This man knows what he's doing with the squad and he's got some amazing talent. I, I think I actually rate Germany a little higher yeah. than you do this particular World and Cup. He, and he also brought back Mario Götze. So you've got um, Muller, Götze, You've got Neuer, obviously, the, the first choice okay, goalkeeper. Yeah. You've also got some really good young players. You've got Sane, yeah. Gundogan, uh, Adeyemi. You've got Gundogan, not, not that young anymore. Well, I mean, <laughs> he's, he's younger than us. So, <laughs> And Mukoku, who, there's lots of talk about him moving to, to Chelsea. I mean, it's, it's a good squad. I mean, it's, it's not Central Coast Mariners, but it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good team nonetheless. Like, so I think Germany have a really, really good chance of making it. They've got, yeah. I like how they've got, and, and I like what you said, because they've got experienced players playing in the right positions to yes. sort of hold the players together and sort of get you know, the, the less experienced players gelling. So I think Germany have a really, really good chance. I agree. Let's, let's see. I think we are definitely missing a good goal scorer. There was a lot of discussion now. We got Niklas Füllkrug from, from Werder Bremen in, but um, the old times, I would say, where we had a close air, where we had a Gerd Müller in the very old times, they are gone. And I think Germany is missing that kind of option. Maybe with Füllkrug we will have it. And the other one is also that the defense is not at a, I would say, a top World Cup level. So, Ooh, wow. um, so I would say they are they are they are great defenders. But Niklas Süle, for example, he came from Bayern Munich and uh, went to Borussia Dortmund. Quite a bit of a discussion on that. Why would someone leave Bayern Munich and go to Dortmund? And um, definitely say if he was fit. It, there's always a question about if you, if you look at him with all respect. Is he really at 100%? So um, don't get me wrong, very good players, but yeah. not on the world-class level. There was a huge discussion also about Mats Hummels not being in the squad. Mm. He played an outstanding um, uh, half season with Borussia Dortmund. And there was really like, will he come back? Same with Müller. Müller did, Hummels did not. So that's why I say, let's see. We can hopefully um, get in for a surprise, but I don't see us up there. That's, that's a surprise. I, I just want to ask, I know I've asked you this personally, but just on the outside looking in, it seems like the German fans expect nothing but greatness of the, or, or nothing but like victory and trophies and all that sort of stuff. Is that, is that true? Like do, do the German fans just expect the German team to win everything every single time? I wouldn't say expect everything and also I think for this World Cup with all the stories that we know are happening in the background in, in Qatar or everything that comes with it, people in Germany are not as excited at the moment about the World Cup as they were in the past. That also is because 
we are playing in Germany now in winter and World Cups in Germany normally are public viewing. We don't have that here in Australia a lot. But in, 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 in Germany, you know, thousands and thousands, thousands of people coming together in the beer garden, you know, in Berlin at the Brandenburger mm. Tor and watching Germany playing at the World Cup. So now you're playing in November, December, where it's getting really cold, people are at home. You're kind of winding down, you know, it's the cold um, part of the year. So coming back to your question, I would say there's definitely originally always that expectation in Germany, I would say semi-final, yes. Mm. But for this World Cup in, in particular, I would say it's not as high, also based on what I um, explained a little bit earlier. So, so you think the next World Cup, not this one? I don't hope so. So we need, yeah. we definitely need, because our last two okay. tournaments were really not good, both the World Cup and also the European Cup. I mean, we lost against England, but we didn't play a good tournament there um, in England last year in June. So from, from that, but hopefully they prove me better and um, the quality is there. Will we get it on the pitch? That's a big question. All right. Uh, look, I think Uruguay, they're, they're always one of these teams that no one would probably think that they would win, but would at least cause some sort of trouble to possibly knock out a favourite, maybe, and then, um, but, but, and then go a little bit further. But that's pretty much it. I don't think anyone's expecting Uruguay to, to win the World Cup or anything like that. Um, I think that there's a lot of optimism in terms of the Uruguayan team and the Uruguayan squad. There's a lot of very good young players, especially in the midfield. We've got um, Federico Valverde, who plays for Real Madrid. Valverde, he's been really, really good um, in uh, La Liga for Real Madrid. He's had a really good season, so he's definitely one to watch. So if there's anyone that sort of likes to see like the young players, one of those players that could sort of have a really good World Cup and then move on to bigger and better things, for Uruguay's case, I think it'll be Valverde. But we'll see how we go. <laughs> but what really impresses me, Gabriel, with, with, with Uruguay is the country is quite small. You have yeah. 1.8 million, roughly, uh, population? 3 million. So 3 million, sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah, 3 million. But still, 3 million, so a quite small country, right? And every year, you, or every time you make it to the World Cup with maybe sometimes a bit more, sometimes yeah. a bit less struggle. Given but you it. were fourth in South Africa in 2010. Yeah. And you always get these really world-class players out there. And I mean, we'll <laughs> talk about Australia later, right? Yeah. Australia is 25 million people. And you can't tell me with all respect to your country yeah. that genetically Uruguay <laughs> has better players than, yeah. than Australia, right? Yeah. But um, And now you, you're still playing with Suarez, with, with Cavani. I'm right. Mm. The quality might not be there anymore as they were maybe years ago, but to see these players, I'm really excited about that, I must say. So, um, yeah, it, 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 yeah, no. you, 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 and in, the group, <laughs> and, and in the group stage, I mean, you're, um, you're playing, uh, yeah, so Portugal is your, your biggest opponent, right? That's yeah. probably very interesting how, how that works well, out of the whole Ronaldo story at the moment. Well, um, yeah, uh, well, Uruguay's opening game is Friday, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time against South Korea. Germany's opening game is Thursday, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Japan. Time against Japan. So uh, three points to uh, Germany there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, look, look uh, you're right. There's, there's uh, Muslera, Godin, Cáceres, Cavani, um, Suarez. They're all playing in um, their fourth World Cup. And they're all said like, this is it. This is their last World Cup and, and that's it. They're done. Um, yeah. I think they'll make it out of the group stages 100%. I, I really do because when you've got yeah. Ghana, you've got South Korea, surely they've got to be going through into the next round. But the thing that I find exciting about Uruguay, but also concerning at the same time is the fact that you look at when their last big world stage wins were, mm. like they've got the, fifth, the 1930 and the 1950 <laughs> yes. official cups, then they've got the two 1924 and 1928 Olympics, which yeah. is, you know, the four-star brand. They're considered, you know, soccer royalty mm. because of what they've done because they won the first ever because they were the, the hosts yeah. for the first ever in, in, back on their 1920. But the thing is, they've won 15 Copa Americas and then they've got the two official FIFAs plus the two Olympic Games. They can be exciting to watch and they've got the talent, but it's been a long time since they've been on the world stage holding up the World Cup. Yes. Credit to them for the no, Copa America, but let's true. be honest, that's one continent. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's very true. I mean, and there's other countries that have sort of you passed, that surpassed Uruguay in, in many different ways. I mean, 
Also, at the same time, the European countries are getting better and better and stronger and stronger. You've got France and Spain who have sort of become this new, the new wave, so to speak. But uh, no, I mean, you're right. But the, the funny thing about Uruguay at the moment is that one of the most sort of talked about people in the squad isn't even a player. It's not even a coach. It's actually a fitness coach. There's a man by the name of Oscar Ortega who is a fitness coach for Atletico Madrid. And he's being classified as probably one of the best, if not the best in the world at what he does. He's so influential that the current coach of Uruguay, Diego Alonso, when he was um, putting his name in to be the uh, coach of the, of the national team, he was about fourth or fifth down the ranking. Like nobody gave him any chance. But what put him over the line was that he said, I'm mates with Oscar Ortega. And he promised me if I become the coach, he'll come with me and uh, be a part of the squad. And that just got him over the line. And a lot of players just sing his praises. Diego Simeone, the coach of um, Atletico Madrid, says he's the best he's ever worked with. And it's like, there's a lot of talk in the media about will he come, won't he, what's going to happen, will Atletico Madrid allow him to go? And it's all this talk. And, and it's like, well, I've never seen this before in any sporting event in any team where there's just so much media attention, so much focus, not on a player, not on a coach, the fitness coach. I've never seen that before. And, and, for pride they take in. and coming, <laughs> coming to fitness um, would be interesting to hear your both opinion in terms of climate over there. Mm -hmm. Do you think the South American teams have a little bit of an advantage, in particular Brazil and Argentina, who probably are a bit better with all respect than Uruguay. But yeah. in terms of climate, that I mean, the South American teams have been, I shouldn't say shocking, but they haven't won since 2002. Yeah. So the last four World Cups went to Europe. Which was in Asia, yeah. by the way, in Japan exactly. and, and South Korea. But then Germany won in Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. So... But I was, I was wondering, is that a bit, could that be a bit of an advantage? Uh, I think, if anything, it's the fitness that's going to put teams over the line. I think that in this case, it's not, okay, who's got the best players or which team plays the, the fanciest? The, one of the reasons why I think Germany are going to do so well is that you guys are a good tournament team and you guys are the best when it comes to extra time and penalties. So when the knockout stages come, the other team, whoever it is that's playing against you guys, have to win in 90 minutes. If not, that's it. Mm. Germany going to win. And, and, and it's not, not, not a given, but the mentality of like, oh, geez, if we go into penalties against Germany, we're, we're you know, gone. So that's a huge advantage. So I think it's also the fitness level. And I think England have a good chance in that regard. Too. So with fitness, obviously, I think arguably, while Australia's never won a World Cup, they are the speediest men out on the pitch in most of them, and their fitness is beyond, above and beyond. One of the things from my sporting career has been a team of champions will never beat a champion team. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's a bit sort of broad to draw that arrow and say the fitness is the difference because you could be slightly older and longer in the tooth in your career, but you've got the nous to play the game. You know how to position mm. yourself, you know how to work your team, and you get the best cohesively as a team. So while fitness certainly will help, and yeah. it's great that your guys got the best in the world, and I, I wish <laughs> them the best for that, but I, I do think that um, the, the mesh of the old and the new and the gameplay and a champion team is what's going to win it this year. Yeah, but we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, I'm sure G Germany will do just fine. <laughs> Uruguay, we don't know, but just to, just to reiterate, Germany's first game is against Japan Thursday, 12 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Friday, 12 a.m. Uruguay versus South Korea. And who knows what could happen there. So we'll see. Um, but anyway, I mean, we can go on about this, but we have to take a very short break. On the other side of the break, we have our special guest, Floyd Cardozo from Melbourne Social Soccer. But first, I want to introduce to you the fourth member of our team, the uh, D'Artagnan to the Three Musketeers or the Shemp to the Three Stooges, Brian Yap, who has a very important announcement. Take it away, Yappers. Hey, I want to tell you about Albert Street Cafe. Albert Street Cafe is a family owned business that has the best coffee in Melbourne. Now I know what you're thinking. With all these coffee places in Melbourne, how can they be number one? But trust me, Albert Street Cafe has the best coffee and sandwiches in Melbourne. They are so good, people are coming from all over Melbourne just to try their coffee. 
visit the friendly staff and see why everyone from all over Melbourne is coming to Albert Street Cafe. Come and see for yourself. Albert Street Cafe, 306 Albert Street, Brunswick. As you know, football can be expensive to play. It can also be very daunting for those who are new to this country and are alone. That's where community organisations like the Melbourne Social Soccer come in. And with us to talk about Melbourne Social Soccer, we have the head of the organisation, Floyd Cardoso. Floyd, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me here. No problem. So what is Melbourne Social Soccer? OK, um, so the concept came about mainly um, because when I first came to Melbourne here in 2017, uh, I just wanted to uh, you know, get into soccer. So I found this group of guys who were just playing around, um, just getting together ad hoc. Um, but as uh, you know, one year went by, I realized that okay, they, they needed a little more help, a little more structure, a little more organized. Because prior to this, um, six months I was in Spain, in Sevilla, where I used to, um, there was a similar sort of concept where the guy used to just organize games um, and he was just by himself. But the joy and the, 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 you know, the fitness they gave me, mm. being there among all these people and meeting different people, um, I know that, okay, uh, he was just by himself, he's doing it, um, it was a difficult task because I always used to talk to him, ask him what's happening, but yeah, it was a struggle because just by himself. So when I came here then, I saw that, okay, um, this is the same sort of problems they're going to have again. So um, we thought of okay, coming together, banding together, making it a little more formal, um, and that's where the idea for Melbourne Social Soccer came up from, actually. Excellent. So that's why, and now after we made formal, you get the opportunities to go look for grants, um, speak to different organizations like yourself, go and, and uh, you know, network more, yeah. um, and just make it bigger, really, because mm -hmm. when you make something formal, Taking it to the next level is pretty easy. Yeah. Well, when there's a structure, like a proper exactly, structure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. Exactly so, that. how many people do you have in the organization? In so, actually, on Meetup, uh, we are one of the biggest groups. We have about 6,000 members. 6,000? Wow. Yeah. wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So, that, that's um, prior to this, there, there was quite a bit already, like a big chunk of it. And year on year, we're growing still, but rapidly, actually, because mm -hmm. the demand for especially after COVID, mm. being yeah. out among people, socializing, that was becoming difficult for people, especially when you're not speaking the language. Um, it becomes it becomes difficult to like, you know, um, mm -hmm. get closer to others. Uh, but, um, you know, football is a language everyone knows. <laughs> exactly. Football is a language, sport is a language. Mm -hmm. So last weekend, mm -hmm. uh, you held a men's tournament, which these two gentlemen joined <laughs> in the three triple Z third yeah. place. Congratulations yeah. to Gabriel and Bernd and the team. Yeah. <laughs> How many of that? those do you tend to hold a year, like the actual competitions? Because I believe there's a women's competition oh, scheduled yeah. for January. Yeah, 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 I'm hoping to be fit enough for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't injure anyone, though, because like, she can, like, with the elbows and everything. Oh, please, so. come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do more on the pitch than keepers do, is all I can say. Yeah, sure. um, so how often would you be running these sort of tournaments to, to sort of because that's another level again, it's one thing to come and play all the time, but then to bring a tournament together and have maybe people from other areas that aren't necessarily your members, but give them the opportunity to play, how often do you run them? Uh, well, this was actually um, the tournament. This was, uh, <laughs> oh, it's the first one. Oh, wow. The first one. Yeah. So basically when we and uh, Gabriel started uh, chatting, that was uh, when, when we had the first uh, radio show. Yeah. Um, we came up with this that so okay the corporate uh, sector has the corporate games they do yeah not for profit side nothing that's mm. amazing yeah. that's true yeah it was a really good uh, event it was a lot of fun there was other organizations there present um, yeah. but it was good uh, even studio m4 had their own team mm. uh in the uh in the in the cup um, three triple z we finished third we missed out on the on the final by one point and uh, oh. i think the the winner i think that was, was the keeping that was the problem yeah that that's, that's it but one of the uh the the winner was melbourne social soccer oh, was one of the, the, the yeah look uh, mm. i'm not saying it was rigged but um i mean they did they i didn't but they did it wasn't rigged but um there, there might be an inquiry uh, a, a, a royal commission next year i'm just no, but, uh, we, we no, no, I'm just joking, I'm joking. 
with the grants, Floyd, <laughs> where, where does the money go? So uh, you said you were, so, you were applying for grants and uh, oh, yeah, you yeah. had some su success, I mean, to, to get money from the government is not like <laughs> yeah, it's an easy process. It's not easy. Right? Yeah. No, it's not. not easy. Uh, with everything, uh, there should be a purpose, right? there should be a why. Yeah. Yeah? So um, what I did was um, go on the different, uh, look at what, what exactly is required. So one big requirement that came right after COVID um, was mental health, mm -hmm. uh, community. Um, these are some of the, 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 the words that you have put here, and women as well. So that's when, uh, going back to your um, little segue, mm -hmm. uh, the women's uh, tournament and the team itself, because last week we have uh, 30 women, that, wow. yeah, so it's big. You know? So um, the reason why this is happening is because there's a big push for uh, the women's game to be evolved as well and yeah. growing. And I think it was a little worse um, on women because when we read the report, definitely women were more affected during COVID time because of the isolation. Mm. Um, so the government actually is supporting a lot for the, the women's soccer side and women's mental health as well, which is amazing. You thought, okay, great. We needed something to grow the game. The government is going in the same direction. Let's just go along the same path. It's amazing. And that's where we got uh, grants mainly starting for with the women and with the men, obviously um, small ones, not as significant, but yeah. It's so, so it's kind of a, um, supporting the game in terms of really not just socially coming together, but actually forming a team that is kind of training also on a, um, a continuous level. Cons yeah, so the, the, the structure that we went for mainly with the women's game as well was um, that it's meant for anyone who has never played the game or for uh, players who have left the game for a long time and they're coming back to it. Aging players, yes. <laughs> anyone, anyone yeah. basically. So we start off with like half an hour of like just stretching and getting back to like, you know, uh, a little bit of the, 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 the practice. Yeah, so we have someone who actually does drills for uh, and, and all these things for us. Okay. Um, and right after that, we go into the game yeah. just so they get a feel for it. And the main, but the actual main thing that happens during the games is after, <laughs> where they usually have like snacks, they have <laughs> drinks and all of these things. Pizza, yeah, pizza, yeah, just with ham on it and everything. But um, yeah, like coming back to what we were saying about the, the women's game, we've, we've noticed that there's been this huge uptick, uptick of um, mm. female participation when it comes yes. to football. Mm -hmm. And in your organization, has the participation rate for women overtaken men? Or is it getting there or? Yeah, uh, definitely getting there, but at a faster rate. Yeah. <laughs> much, much faster rate. And consistently, because um, we've had, um, well, like everything, you know, um, we have a lot of um, organizers try to you know, come to us telling us, like, uh, how do you grow, how do you, um, how do you, um, you know, um, grow the women's game or, you know, just how you're managing it. Like, you have to put effort. Yeah. You have to be with them, mm. uh, traveling with them, like, you know, following up with everyone, making sure they're doing okay, how they, you know, catering to exactly what they want, not what we want. Yeah. And the women's side is run for women by women. That's the main thing. Okay. Yeah. To actually... Like when we were just talking earlier about how it's how Melbourne Social Soccer was set up, mm. um, obviously it wouldn't have been easy. Uh, there would have been a lot of um, setbacks and a lot of problems mm. and people promising everything and then not not <laughs> not delivering at all. How hard was it to actually get a organisation like Melbourne Social Soccer up and running? Because a lot of people forget that it's not easy just to like start up something like mm. this. Mm. That, that it requires a lot of work, a lot of effort, oh, and yeah. especially if it's on a volunteer basis. Yeah. So. Um the challenges before, before forming this, so there was all these group of guys, uh, a lot of them playing just informally, just coming together, uh, putting two bags, kicking the ball around, yeah. Yeah, like with everything, uh, and playing on, on a pitch which was not really, we didn't have the permits, we were just playing there. But when we, when you obviously, like you know, when you become official, then the challenge is, um, how do you make yourself official? That's by getting the permits, uh, making sure that the the, uh, the authorities know who you are. So mainly the challenge there was making sure that people know that Melbourne Social Soccer exists. That's going to the councils, going to different organizations, uh, telling them, okay, we're here, 
uh, this is what we do, this is how we'd like to grow, can we have permits for these grants, can we have, um, yeah, uh, you know, support wherever we need, like, you know, um, not in terms of money, uh, not always, like, you know, not everyone has, like, endless money to give out, mm. so, uh, but that was the main challenge, getting it mainly to be accepted as, you know, official. Yeah. That was one of the biggest challenges. Is it free to come and join Melbourne Social Soccer? And also how often can somebody, can a, can a female player or a gentleman turn up and have a social game? Oh, uh, so, okay. So we charge very nominally. So for the women, we charge $8 per game. Mm -hmm. um, and for the, the men, it's uh, $10. But that's just to cover like basic costs because, uh, you know, uh, like pitch order and things yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, like just Balls, admin nets. costs. Like, yeah. yeah, very, very uh, basic because we have other organizations out there. So we did our research as well. They're charging twenty dollars per game, fifteen, twenty dollars per game. So we keep it on the low end just so it's accessible for students and someone who's coming new into the city. But if someone has financial problems, obviously they're just getting started. We tell them come to us. Tell us, yeah. we are more than happy to just play. That's not an issue. Yeah. And if people want to get involved, so they just can rock up. I think you're playing in Carlton, Princess Park, right? Princess Park. So just can rock up and say, hey, I want to play here today. Or do they have to go through a certain website? Yeah, or so, how does it work? Yeah, so we um, we do our, all our bookings through through Meetup. That's just to make it a little more streamlined because there's like we already have like 6,000 members. So anyone who's coming new, can join us, but it's just easier for us to manage um, through mm -hmm. Meetup itself. Like you know, just so we know, mainly because we've had issues where people turned up, um, and if something happens, we have no record of um, if they've created some problems. Oh, okay. We don't have records of, of mm. who they are, yeah. where they come from, and all of these things. So just to make sure that if there's an emergency as well, mm -hmm. we know how to track these things. So yeah. it's mainly for the safety of the person, not really. Sure. Um, worrying about us. And is there a website for Melbourne Social Soccer and uh, obviously yeah. the Facebook and, yeah, and socials so as well? Yeah, melbournesocialsoccer.com. Um, we have our Facebook page as well. We have our meetup as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, people like y'all who make it uh, yeah. amazing. So, sounds good. And it, it, it is an amazing organization mm -hmm. and all the very best of luck to, to you and to everybody involved at Melbourne Social Soccer. And before uh, you go, who you who are you supporting at the World Cup? Oh, is there anyone? Okay, so nice story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, part three. Uh, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I am. Okay, let me show you. I'm from Greece. This is a little place called. So we need to show you the camera. Right yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See those things? They're the yeah. cameras. <laughs> this is the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so I am. From India, a little place called Goa. Oh, ah. Portuguese colony. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm from a Portuguese colony, and we have always supported uh, Portugal. Yeah, and they're in the same group as Uruguay. So um, no, I'm not supporting Uruguay. I was going to say good luck to Melbourne Social Soccer, but no, 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 good, no, no, good, no, good luck, good luck to Portugal. They won't need it. But uh, no, thank you very much, Floyd. Good luck to you. Good luck to everybody at Melbourne Social Soccer. We're going to have a little break. We're going to have Margaret Perrell, who is the uh, supporter of the French men's national football team, uh, coming up on the other side of the break. But first, here's Brian Yap. Hey, football fans! I know you want quality footballs at affordable prices. And I also know that you want footballs made ethically right here in Australia. Then look no further than Winter Sports. They make quality footballs for all levels of players and clubs at affordable prices. Look at these amazing footballs. Buy in bulk and save money. When you think of quality, think of Winter. Go to www.wintersports.com.au or email info at and win with Winchester.